Good evening. My name is Carrie Snyder, and I am the Assistant Dean for Disability Access and Inclusion Student Services, known as DAIS, formerly the Disability Resource Center. And I want to welcome everybody to tonight's presentation. And I'd like to introduce you to Sherry Denkinson, class of 89. Sherry is a quadriplegic of 38 years. She was injured at age 16 in a diving accident. Sherry grew up in a small town of 600 in Accord, New York in Ulster County, now a hotspot for folks from the city. She received her BS in business administration from the University of Albany and minored in political science. Sherry spent all her years living on state quad with the same four roommates. I think we saw some pictures of those. She spent many fun summers in Albany taking classes and working but had to escape the brutal winter and went south to get her law degree from Georgetown University Law Center. Sherry spent her entire legal career working in the federal inspector general community with 19 years at the US Department of Health and Human Services Office of Inspector General, where she served in many high level positions, including special assistant and senior advisor. Sherry and her husband, who also has a disability, own a business called Happy on Wheels LLC. Their vision is to inspire people with and without disabilities to live happier lives. They do so through motivational speaking, writing, mentoring, and consulting. Sherry is a member of the Rockefeller College Dean's Advisory Board, where she serves as a mentor to students of all ages. She received the Dean's Award for Outstanding Service to Rockefeller College students in 2020. A significant portion of Sherry's business is working with individuals on their college and graduate school essays, as well as serving as a job coach for any age group in areas such as resume writing, networking, interviewing, and skills analysis. Sherry is a lifelong disability advocate. She was vice president of disabled students at Albany, served on the Dean's advisory board at Georgetown Law as an accessibility consultant as the school built its first dormitory and served six years, three years as VP on the board of a local center for independent living. Sherry is also a breast cancer survivor and a fierce advocate for women's health, especially accessible mammogram machines and adjustable exam tables. She is an ambassador for the American Cancer Society and 2020 was named as a women's health ambassador for the Center for Minority Health, US Department of Health and Human Services. Sherry is a renowned motivational speaker and storyteller, even a Grand Slam winner of the Moth and an award-winning writer. Among other publications, she is a columnist for New Mobility Magazine and an ambassador, regional champion, grant reviewer, and guest blogger for the Christopher and Dana Reed Foundation. She is currently writing her first book and pursuing a certificate in diversity, inclusion, and equity through Cornell. Sharon and her husband, Tony, reside in Arlington, Virginia. They are rabid sports fans, including the Great Danes, Georgetown Hoyas, 17-year season ticket holders to men's basketball, and the James Madison Dukes, who ironically share the colors of purple and gold. Please welcome Sherry. Carrie, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, and I guess as far as purple and gold goes, you probably saw a lot of pictures with purple and gold, uh, a staple of my wardrobe. So thank you very much. I wanna really give a shout out to the staff and those that put together this Great Danes Connect as a way to keep individuals that have graduated from Albany connected to the university. It's really important. I also wanna welcome Many of my advisory board friends, uh, friends from all many days, individuals that are in the current semester in Washington cohort, those that have been in the cohort, which you saw some fun pictures of after their times, and other friends and family. So before I start with the title of this presentation, Green Beans and Macaroni and Cheese, not from the dining hall, let me give you a little background. First, uh, I had to have my own key to get into the back of the cafeteria of State Quad. So I would go down in the elevator with a friend, we'd open the back door and go in. And we did not have the luxury of the grand amount of food that is now available in the campus center. Oh my gosh, I had a chance to look at that. No, we had the dining hall. So we tried to escape it sometimes. Uh, the way we did that was a definite Sunday run by one of my roommates in our part of Brugger's, and we ate 
actually we ate bagels with three inches of cream cheese. I'm sure it had three inches of cream cheese. And we also, luckily, one of my roommates was an RA because inside my clothes closet was a microwave and a toaster oven. Uh, a little bit of a fire hazard, but we got away with it. So that's how we warmed up our food. And that's how we made it through Albany. So now let me tell you my story and I'll give you some nuggets as we go along that I hope you can take with you after this evening. I will take questions at the end. I don't want you to just be listening to me. If you have any, just put them in the Q&A and we'll be addressing them afterwards. So macaroni and cheese. I was injured at 16 in a diving accident. I think what I can tell you about that is life throws you curveballs and you never know when they're gonna happen. Uh, and all you can do with those curveballs is decide to be angry or decide to move forward. And I was angry for a long time, but anger takes a lot of energy. And I decided soon enough that I was going to try to move forward and say to myself, it's not what happens to you in life, it's what you do with it. So while I was at rehab at Burke Rehabilitation Center in Westchester, New York, which many of you New Yorkers are familiar with, I was there for eight months learning how to make my life go again, literally from top to bottom with a body that didn't work anywhere near the way it used to. And one night I got macaroni and cheese and green beans for dinner. And my nurse Paul reeled it in on one of those lovely trays that fit over you from the hospital, took off the cover and gave me my fork, which I put in this cuff that I wear. And he started walking out the door. Now, until that time, I had had somebody feed me. And even though I didn't want to really go back to life, going around and having somebody feed me, I did want to feed myself and do whatever I could independently. I didn't think I could do it. And I was pissed. So as Paul walked out of the room, I just get, kept yelling, Paul, Paul, are you coming? And he turned around and he said, you're ready. You can do it. I'll be back. And he walked out. And I'll never forget looking up at the clock on the wall. And it was 5.30. And I started to cry, sobbing. And then it was 5.40. And then it was 5.45. And then it was close to 6 o'clock. And I was still sobbing, but I was tired. And I figured that my food was getting pretty cold. So I decided to start. And I lifted up my right arm and I stuck my fork in and most of the macaroni and cheese fell onto my lap, but I got a little bit. And then the green beans, I tried those and I got a little bit and then it fell off. And it went on and on and on. And when Paul walked back in, half of it was in my lap. Half of it was in my stomach. I wasn't crying, but I expected Paul to be, give me this big bravo, you've done it. And he turned and he looked at me and he said, good job, you'll do better next time. Well, that was a life lesson that you are going to drop things, whether it's macaroni and cheese, whatever it is, you are gonna fall and it's gonna hurt and it's gonna scar, but you're gonna get up and soon enough, I could eat my entire plate of food, whatever it was, and do it all by myself. So know that life is not white picket fences and reality TV. It's curveballs, it's fighting and getting up, even though you don't want to, and sometimes getting a real nudge when you won't, don't want to move forward. So going along from that, I want to also say that you need to not be afraid to ask for help. When I first came to Albany, I was scared. I didn't know if I could do it. I was 16. I came home. I graduated from high school, but I was leaving to go away to college, an hour and a half with my parents, and I didn't even know who my roommates were going to be. In those days, you didn't go on Facebook. I know I'm dating myself, right? You got a little piece of paper in the mail. You open it up. It had the names of the people you were going to live with and their phone number. And I had to decide 
if I was going to tell them when I called them that I had a disability. And I thought about it and I said, you know what? I'm not going to tell them because if I tell them, they're going to get this vision in their mind of me as, I don't know what they're going to vision of, but I had this thought that I didn't want them to know that I was just going to arrive. And so we all got there. And ironically, we all got along really well. You heard that we lived together for four years on state quad. I think that goes down in Albany record history. But at that time, there was no accessible place to live outside of the dorms. There was no Freedom Quad. Um, and downtown, the houses were not accessible. So we had no choice. We stayed together. We were all in the business school. We were well known on campus. And we had a great time. And a number of years ago, we were having a conversation and I said, you know, I was always wondering something. When you guys met me, what did you think? You had come to college. I had never met anybody with a quad as a quadriplegic myself. What did you think? And they said, you know what, Sherry? We were afraid and nervous ourselves because we were moving away from home and doing something incredibly new. And that was an aha moment because I didn't even think about what it was like to be in somebody else's shoes because I was so caught up in myself. So never have expectations of what's going on in other people's lives. We all have challenges. Some may look at me and think that my challenges are harder than somebody else's. I'm not in the game of comparing challenges. None of us should be. We have to work on our own challenges, not be afraid to ask for help and figure out a way to get through it. But along the way, I was lucky and you can be lucky too. There was a woman named Nancy Belowich Negron, who I hope is on tonight, who made a complete difference in my life. If you were as a mentor and we all should look for individuals that can be mentors because we can learn a lot from mentors. They guide you, they give you knowledge, and they help you find your way. And there's nothing bad about that. Nancy was the head of what was called Disability Student Services. And I came up to visit Albany with my family before I even moved there a couple months later. And I didn't know if I could do college. I was very scared. My mother was in the wreck. And Nancy was there on a Saturday, and she introduced me to a woman named Sheila. And Sheila looked just like me. And as soon as I saw Sheila, and I knew that she was living on State Quad and that she was making it through school, that I could too. And from that time forward, and even until today, Nancy is one of my favorite friends, but she helped me learn what I could do for myself, how I could operate independently, and that I could and I would make it through college. And she assured my parents that she would watch out for me. And she did. So what else do I want to share with you? I want to share with you that we are all inventors. Now, I'm not talking like Thomas Edison kind of stuff, or, you know, some of you might be inventing something major that I don't know about. But we're all going to come across obstacles that we need to figure out how to get around, whether it's a boss, co-worker, getting our transportation, et cetera. And some of mine were pretty basic, but they were so basic they were necessary. The first was I thought I was going to record every single class on my, my little tape recorder, yes, I'm dating myself again, then go back to my room, play the, the tape and type up the notes. Well, I learned pretty fast that that was gonna be unachievable, that I would have no time to study. So I set out and I made a friend in each class and I said, look, can I borrow your notes? Because I wasn't sure I could keep up taking notes. We didn't have laptops and all that kind of stuff. We didn't get our stuff on a screen. And I started taking notes. And then when you take notes one day, two days, three days, before you know it's a week, and then you know it's two weeks. And then by the time three weeks came, I could keep up. So practice, practice, practice. I killed that one. I figured it out. I could do it. I didn't need somebody anymore. Then other challenges came in my work career. I had a flip phone. Yes, another dating myself. I had a flip phone. 
And I could use the end of my pen that you see right here. And I could tap on that phone. I could tap on the screen. I could, I got rid of my flip phone. I got another phone, which I could read all my emails before I got to the office on the Metro. Then boom, I get a brand new phone and it won't work with my pen. And I'm like, what the heck is going on? I was flipping out. I went to the IT people at work and they didn't know. I went to the VP of Microsoft and I sent him a letter and I said, I don't understand why you're improving the technology, but I can no longer use my pen on the phone. And he actually answered me. He said, wow, we've improved technology, but we didn't realize that while improving it, we were making it less accessible. The deal is that we had to make the screens out of a different material because the pixels are better, so you could take better pictures. But the only way that you can do it is to use your finger, which was not an option for me, or a stylus. Well, I can't hold the stylus in my hand. My hands don't work. So I became an inventor. And I remember going to bed and trying to figure it out. Finally, I found these styluses, which were a pen on one side and a stylus um, on the other, stylus being like the, the rubber part. So now, as you can see on my cuff, on one side, I have my pen. On the other side, I have my stylus, maybe a little bit. And I can use my phone easily. So another example of figuring things out for yourself. Don't give up. You can do it. Another thing for you to know. Finally, I want to talk about the fact that you should always give back. I got so much from Albany. I was able to make amazing friends. I had great professors. I've made wonderful friends on the advisory board. And it's given me a purpose to help other students figure out how to go through this crazy way of finding a job nowadays and mock interviewing. There was a picture in there of me mock interviewing with a student um, that had graduated. And then when he got that job, he's gotten multiple jobs since then. But it makes me feel good to help students. And it also helps me give back to the university. So for those of you out there that are alums and you have not gotten involved, there are many ways to get involved. The other thing it's done is I've gotten to meet so many other people that I didn't know because we didn't graduate together. And you saw lots of pictures of us cheering at a lot of great game games. And I never would have known these individuals. And we have a great time. We've got a great group in Washington, Albany, New York City. We have meetings. It's wonderful. And you saw us at some breast cancer walks. I've taken my mentees with me. One of them was in the photo. But I have my breast cancer survivor, but I have been an, an enormous advocate and believer in the American Cancer Society making strides against breast cancer campaign. And I've been involved in that every single year. And that's another way that I feel like I give back. And it's proven that when you do things like that, it increases your happiness. That by giving and getting gratitude, you yourself feel happier. And I can tell you that's the truth. So finally, I want to tell you one more little story. Um, and none of these were my Moth Grand Slam winners. You'll, you'll, I'll have to tell you about that another time, but storytelling is fun. This isn't paying money. Um, my, my first year of law school, we were in constitutional law. It was a smaller class at Georgetown. Most of the classes were big. And I was at the bottom. It was sort of like the LCs in Albany where there were steps and I was at the bottom. So the professor started on the other side of the room and he asked everyone to say their name and where they went to college. So all the way around until it got to me, I heard Harvard, I heard Stanford, I heard UMich, I heard Wellesley, I heard every Columbia. I mean, you're, you're talking like the top 10, whatever. So when it came to me, and at that point, Albany was not U Albany, and it wasn't Division One to my dismay. Um, I whispered 
SUNY Albany. I was embarrassed. I felt like, oh my gosh, these people went to the most unbelievable schools. How, what am I doing here? Even though I didn't think about the fact that they had accepted me at Georgetown. What am I doing here? And how am I going to compete or even pass with these people that have gone to like the best schools in the country? Well, guess what? I graduated. I didn't fail. And in fact, I spent two semesters on the Dean's List, which at Georgetown, I felt was a big victory. So I will never, and I will tell anybody that goes to Albany and those on the advisory board have heard me tell this story to any student that there. Never, ever, ever be ashamed of your Albany education. It is what you make it to be. Your life is what you want it to be. And how you get there is up to you. And you are getting a great education and the tools for it as long as, it, as you take advantage of it. So let me close by saying that I was chosen to give the commencement address at Albany. It was very famous for the fact that as soon as I got up to speak, it was a huge gust of wind like in Wizard of Oz. My remarks flew away and then there was a major thunderstorm. Everybody got soaking wet and was freezing. So I don't think anybody really ever heard what I had to say, even though I had to try out to get this. But what I did have in those remarks was that we're all captains of our own ship. It's up to us to get to where we go and how we're going to get there. So I'll stop now and we'll open it up for questions. Thank you all. Sherry, I just want to say as a fellow alum, I really appreciate your remarks about you, Albany. So thank you. Um, we do have a question in the Q&A. So I'm going to start with the one that we have from Josie Ernest. And Josie says, thank you for taking time out of your day to share your story. And thank you to everyone who put this together. And then has a couple of questions. What was the atmosphere like at U Albany with regards to students with disabilities during your time at the university? Did you receive a lot of university and staff support? And can you talk more on how you managed without technology with the large coursework? Wow, those are really, really, really great questions. Um, so first, um, remind me, first was, um, did, how did I find support for students with disabilities and the accessibility of the campus? Am I getting that right? Um, yeah, what was what was the atmosphere like at UAlbany the atmosphere. regarding students with disabilities? Yeah. Yeah. So I want to say that even though it was pre-ADA, so the Americans with Disabilities Act was not passed until 1990. And um, I was attending Albany from 1985 to 1989. Um, and without becoming a lawyer, um, Albany was covered and had to do a number of things because they were a public institution and the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 covered those things. But for being a, a campus, you know, that it was, I will say that it was very good for a number of reasons. First of all, Nancy. Um, Nancy's office, which is Carrie's office, was incredibly supportive, uh, letting me know what my rights were as far as requesting extra time for exams, making sure that there was an accessible room for me to be living in, making sure that there were door openers where there could be. Uh, and I never ran into any trouble with any faculty having um, a problem with any of my needs as far as, you know, needing extra time for exams. I will tell you that I was a tunnel dweller and rumor has it that because of COVID, the tunnels are closed. But for those of you that are not familiar with Albany, it was designed to be in Arizona. So the academic podium is like a wind tunnel. And cold is an understatement. Like I still have visions of Albany free space. Like I haven't experienced that maybe once or twice since I've come to Washington, which is why I came down here. But when you round a corner and you're in the wind tunnel, getting to the library was insanity. So I would literally go from State Quad to the Earth Science Building, which I don't know if it's still called Earth Sciences, 
get in the elevator and go down. And I would not leave the podium until the end of the day. And I knew how to get around the tunnels, which was not easy because you had to figure out which door you needed to use to get into the, even the rat skeller for like their, their fried nuggets or chicken nuggets, which is my favorite Friday lunch. So I was a tunnel dweller and that kept me out of the cold. Um, there was pretty good plowing. I don't think, I, I think we had one snow day the entire time, but even if we had like 12 or 14 inches of snow, it would be plowed. So there'd be a path to get from state quad to the dorms. The shower was not completely rolling. There was only one little lip, but I was able to get in and I was able to have my own room. So that, that was good. Um, and I did feel supported. I, I really felt like if I was having troubles that I could go to Nancy's office and we would talk it through. So that was, that was great. Um, and then as far as improvements, I mean, I've been back to campus and I have to say, I'm, I'm incredibly impressed with the, even the more progress that's been made when Freedom Quad opened the year after I graduated. I know that there was a, that there is a dorm in there, um, maybe more than one now that there's more with a roll-in shower and a kitchen and everything. I mean, we didn't have a kitchen. We had a kitchen in my closet. But, you know, that was one of the things that we really wanted. But at that point, it, you could only live on a quad. So it's grown in its accessibility. And, you know, with technology, it's gotten a lot better. Um, at the time, the buses to get downtown did not have lifts. So going out was not really easy for me. There weren't accessible taxis. I did have my own van. Um, but uh, we won't talk about that. No. Okay, we can't talk about it. Um, you know, you really shouldn't drink and drive and it's not like I could just hop in a taxi, but uh, we would take turns sometimes. And um, one of my roommates would say, okay, I'll be the one this night. And we'd go down to uh, some of the downtown tap holes um, and uh, have ourselves a really good time. And that's why we'd sleep late and we'd eat Gruber's bagels and lots of sleep on Sunday. Um, but the buses uh, now do. Um, and there's a loop to go down to the downtown campus and also to get downtown. So, and there's paratransit services. And the second question, Carrie, if you could remind me. Uh, how did you manage without technology doing your coursework? That is in, oh my gosh. So I don't even know if people can imagine this, but, um, the quote, I won't say older, the more seasoned of us on this, on this Zoom um, had a very interesting time. First, I'll talk about cell phones and ATMs. And I know my former roommates are, are cracking up, but I think we were a very organized crew for our, for our age. There was only one phone and it was on the wall. You didn't have your own cell phone. We made a phone schedule because some of us had to talk to our parents once a week. Some of us had a boyfriend or, or in a different place. And so it needed to be fair. And we made a phone schedule. Now what went along with that is most younger people don't even know about this. You would get a phone bill and an envelope. And probably one of the most dreaded things was when whoever went down the front way to the dining hall past the mailboxes and opening up the mailbox, you would get the phone bill. And ours was probably about half an inch thick. And it was brought back after lunch. And then somebody would have to go through and figure it out. Let's just say that a couple of months, some people in my room, some of my roommates had phone bills that made them want to drop on the floor because they did not have enough money in their bank account to pay the phone bill. So the phone situation was interesting. We did not have our own cell phones and we had the phone bill issue. The second was money. So you would pay for your, for your meal plan. And all that was, was going to the dining hall. It wasn't like it is now in the campus center where you can use a card and it's filled up with whatever amount you can get a Starbucks. So you can go to the Asian noodle place or my friend's son that was in the um, 
video sitting on the table with me. I went up to do a talk and, he, and I met him for lunch. He's like, oh, I'll treat. It's just my parents' money on my card, which I left. So, you know, he treated me to lunch. Um, but we had to get money out of the ATM. Um, we actually used cash. Yeah, I know that's a foreign concept. And at the time, there was one in the campus center. I think there were two in the campus center. That's it. And you could withdraw a dollar. And I have a roommate that would withdraw a dollar because it's all she had left in her bank account. A pizza was $6. So we'd figure out enough money between us to get a pizza, which we ordered even if we weren't hungry. So the technology for money was pretty interesting. Uh, my parents gave me a credit card, but I was only allowed to use it if there was an emergency. And it wasn't like you could go anywhere on campus and just like put in your credit card to get food. The other issue was computers. So I was the only one in the suite who had a computer. If you can imagine the big old computers, it still used DOS operating system. When you typed on it, it was like the green, you know, the green, the black screen with the green lines. And I had a dot matrix printer, which used the paper that has little holes in the side. And for those of you that lived through those days, having a paper jam was not unusual. And if you didn't get the paper right on those little spikes, right where it should be, you were gonna have a mess. So two things happened that were interesting. One was that I had a paper that was due and I'm not a last minute person. It was the day before, it was all finished and I went to print it out and the stupid printer jammed. And it jammed so bad with paper that no matter what we did, we couldn't fix it. I was like screaming and yelling and crying and my roommates were trying to fix it and we were yanking, trying to yank the paper out. But there was a little piece because you could take the sides off with they were perforated and we were trying to take the sides off. We couldn't get it. So what happened was I went to my professor and I just said, look, my paper is done. Um, I'm giving it to you on a floppy disk. Yes, a big floppy disk. Can you please print it out? Because my printer's broken. And luckily the, the, the professor said yes. The other thing that I did was my roommate was working on a project on the computer. And I was doing something, not sure what I did. And I pushed a button and I literally wiped out the hard drive. And not like today where there's backups and backups and backups. I don't know how she didn't like ultimately defriend me for the rest of my life, but her work was all gone. But she went and explained it to a professor and he understood. So not having technology, um, you know, at the time we only had what we had. So we didn't really know what we were missing. And I think it made it a lot more difficult, even through law school. When I was in law school, you didn't have laptops. So I wrote all my notes and then I would, you know, transfer things to index cards because I learned by writing. Um, but there is absolutely, you know, nothing that we had. We didn't have we didn't have laptops in class to type our notes. We didn't have dictating systems that I use now to dictate to the computer. Even in law school, those things didn't exist. Not until I got my first job was Dragon Naturally Speaking even used. And the microphone was huge. The technology required lots and lots of training to get used to your voice. Now you don't even have to train it. I'm on like, you know, Dragon 16 point whatever. But I used to joke with people at my job that, you know, I was talking to my computer and there should be a sign over my head that said on air because people had no idea what I was talking about. So I think it made it harder. But what I think is we accommodated to what we had because we didn't know what we didn't have yet. Um, it's made life a lot easier. But through my story about the phone, you know, how it got better. But then Microsoft realized, wow, when we make things better, sometimes we make it not easier. And that's one of the issues that I'm working on in the area of 
diversity, equity, and inclusion is when design occurs, whether it's for a building, whether it's for a piece of um, you know, software, an app, or whatever, that to be fully inclusive, you need to have people at the table before you make it. If you make it something or build something and it's not accessible for not just physical accessibility, but other disabilities, then you've got to backtrack. And that's when you hear the moans and groans, it's too expensive and people with disabilities are a pain. You know, we're not a pain. And universal design, which makes it better for everyone. I mean, if there's an automatic opener that you don't have to touch, now it's a great thing for COVID if you don't have to touch a button. Look, that's easier for me. I just swipe my hand up and down and the door opens. So I think there's going to be a real positive movement in that direction as we go forward for individuals with disabilities. I know that wasn't part of the question, but I think it's important to illustrate where we were and how far we've come. And even though we still run into the same things where I feel like I'm bashing my head against the wall, such as mammograms and exam tables, some of the things that um, I really advocate hard for. And some days I'm doing what I call ABA 101. It's like, yeah, there's only one step. You're not accessible. Um, yes, tell, tell. You told me I could get into the shower, but it's a bathtub. You know, uh, explaining to people what it really means to be accessible. 30 years later, and sometimes we're having some of those same discussions. So if you're out there and you work for a company, <laughs> make sure they do things right. And what's part three, Carrie? Um, I think you answered part three. It was, um, did you receive a lot of university and staff support? Yes, yeah. And I did it at law school as well. Um, my first year of law school and law school, my courses were year long. So for the first year of law school, you took one, you had, well, except for constitutional law, that was a test in December. But all of my other classes, so I had four other classes were year long, which meant you had one chance at the end to take the exam and that was it. Talk about stress. And in March of my first year of law school, I got a really bad burn and I had to be in bed and down. Now, that's before any kind of um, courses that are done online, like now, the Cornell course I'm taking is all, you know, I listen to videos and I read on my computer. That didn't exist when I was in law school. So I got notes from other friends. I had to try to read my book in my bed on this tip tray. It was a nightmare. And I was convinced that this was, this was not going to work. So I spoke to the registrar and I'm like, I, I'm only just going to be allowed to get up starting in May. And that's when my finals are supposed to be. But I don't want to have to repeat the entire first year of law school. I mean, it's awful. And they were very easy to work with. I talked to the registrar and they said, you can take your finals in July. And I did. And I passed. And I didn't have to stay back. But you never know what's going to happen and you just have to be, you know, you have to learn to be an advocate for yourself. Everybody does. You have to use your voice. And, you know, there are many people, even without disabilities, that are faced with discrimination, are faced with situations where they're not treated correctly, and they don't have the confidence to speak up. And that's where I really feel first a need to advocate for others who don't necessarily have that voice to make it better. And I also feel that it's a moral obligation for me to really try to do things to help those that come behind me. Because I've been a quadriplegic for 38 years and I've been through a lot and learned a lot. And I wanna help someone who is fighting a battle but doesn't really know what to do to give them the confidence to know that they have rights and they should be advocating for those rights. And that applies to whether you have a disability, to whether you're not treated right at work, to whether you are in an abusive relationship, to whether you're at college and someone is denying you something that you're entitled to. And it even comes to the workplace where, you know, you don't think you're being treated fairly. 
finding a way to talk in a very appropriate manner and kind manner and not accusatory manner, but to explain your situation and give the other person the benefit of the doubt you're not in their shoes. You may not know why they're doing what they're doing and they may not realize that they're doing anything. So I like to start with a good heart and not assume that something is being done directly to discriminate against me. So I'm not the let's get in the fight right away mode. I try to uh, negotiate and talk reasonably and be reasonable. And usually that works things out. They understand me, I understand them, and we come to a resolution. However, and I say a big however, there are laws and other things on the books. And my view about the ADA or even other things that you need to be brought to a higher level. One of my lines is everybody has a supervisor. And if you try and you try and you try, you need to feel that you have the right to say, I want to speak to management or if you're in academia, I want to speak to, you know, you're a different professor or I am going to file a complaint with the Department of Justice because you're violating my civil rights. And that's a law that's on the books. So I believe in negotiating and doing things reasonably, but I also think it's very important for people to feel confident and to maybe a mentor help them figure out, you know, actually practice. Um, it's sort of like mock interviewing. One of the great things that Rockefeller College does is they arrange mock interviews for students. And so um, myself and a number of people on the advisory board, we sign up and we get assigned a student. We have a standard set of questions and we do mock interviews and then we give feedback. And that is one of the most important things that I think I didn't have. Um, I didn't know what to do. I, um, I went right to law school and, and then I wound up being able to get a job. But it was just practicing and you get rid of the ums and the whatever. And, you know, it's really good to get feedback. And I get calls from students that, you know, are getting to see another job they're interested in. And, hey, can you help me figure out how to draft a really good cover letter? I mean, I say that my, my, uh, my people I mentor and I get to mentor, they're with me for life, um, my groupies. And, uh, you know, I'm always willing to help a student um, who needs help. Um, I do it as part of my business, but, and I charge, but um, if you will go to Albany, you sort of get a pass. That actually leads us very nicely into the next question, which is from CJ Prasina, um, who's from Alliston and Bird LLP. And it was, what characteristics and traits would you tell students to look for in a mentor? Oh, CJ. Um, so I just tell you a little bit about CJ. Um, and then I'll answer that question. Um, so when I worked at the Department of Health and Human Services in my later, my final years, um, before I was, I had to retire because of illness, um, I was a senior advisor in the Office of Audit Services. And I loved having interns. I think interns are the best. Um, and for any students who are in the Washington semester program or those in Albany that get to intern at the state capitol, those are amazing experiences and you should really take advantage of them because it gives you, first of all, the ability to network, second of all, to get on the job experience. So you literally graduate from college having known what it is to be in a workplace, knowing how to network because that's how you get different jobs. So what I, you know, CJ was one of my law school interns and I just throw everything at an intern. I believe that they are incredibly capable. And for anybody out there who is in a workplace and doesn't take advantage of having an intern, I think you're missing out. Uh, yet, you know, yes, they may have to do administrative duties sometimes, but you know, you can really offload some of your work um, and talk about um, knowledge of electronics. Like, I can't make a presentation like someone who learned all the Microsoft publishing stuff. I'm like, I'm like pathetic. But I think it's very important to look for a mentor. Um, and what qualities that I would suggest are 
first of all, someone that follows up with you. So, you know, I always tell students, you don't know how busy somebody else is. You don't know what's on their plate. So if you want to pick their brain and you think there's someone, a person because of their background or, or skill set that you'd like to talk to, that you should really make sure you know that. There was just a Harvard Business Review article uh, last week that I sent to the semester in Washington students about how to approach someone that you want to speak to. And it had like five top tips. And this was one of them. It's, you know, sending an email and saying, you know, I'm really interested in talking to you about being specific, you know, say something specific, not, you know, something so broad. Um, and, you know, I'm from whatever group and, you know, I'd love to talk to you at your convenience. And if you don't get a follow-up on one and you email again, I would say that person is not a good person to be your mentor. Not out of anything bad, but they may just may be too busy or you don't know why, or they're just not interested in doing it. So you want somebody that's responsive. You also want somebody that's interested in your success. So if you find a mentor at work, which is a great place to find a mentor um, in your in your jobs field, you know, through some association or some group organization, what you want to do is really pick their brain and show them that you're interested and make sure that they're interested in you. So for instance, when I've been at an intern at work, I would make sure that they got things to do that were substantive, but that wasn't the end of the story. They got to then share it. I mean, my view was, I'm not looking for power. I, I don't need, you know, boxes checked off. You did it, you send it out to everybody. You know, I reviewed it, looks great. CC me, but, you know, do that presentation, do that, you know, right up of a hearing on the hill. I mean, in CJ's case, he got to work on prepping for the very first hearing on the Affordable Care Act. I mean, I said, go ahead. They asked me, I said, go ahead. You know, you want someone that's not going to say, uh-uh, I don't want to look inferior. I don't want an intern doing what I could do. You want someone that says, yes, I believe in you. You can do it and you deserve the credit. And the last thing that I would say to the person who is the intern is if you get a good mentor and they stay with you along your way and they are invested in you and they continue to be invested in you because along the way, you're going to need recommendations, people. Be good. You know, go to office hours. If you're on campus and find someone good who might need to write a letter of breath. Um, and not that you're doing it to kiss up, but you're going to need letters of recommendation. But what you want is to say thank you. Whether it's, you know, I know, you know, sitting down and writing a thank you is not the vogue thing to do today. Um, and it might not get there with the mail. But even a simple typed email, which says, I really appreciate the fact that you have taken time out of your busy schedule to help me. And then stay in touch. You know, you move on to another job or, you know, even if you're in another city, don't forget that person who would always be there for you if you need it. I mean, a number of my interns have, you know, called me and said, I'm, get, I'm getting an interview for another job. They're going to call you. Is that okay? Look, I haven't spoken to that person in three years. I'm not going to feel so great about it. I hear they are out of the blue calling me and they want me to say all the great things they're doing. And I haven't heard from them in three years. I mean, a lot of my semester in Washington students, um, I hear from them all the time or I see them when I go to Albany or I see them if they move back to BC and we keep in touch. And so when I get a call or I get asked to take a call, I am you know, giving them a stellar review. And in most cases, they get the job. Now, my view is as a mentor, you can always open a door through your connections but what I tell to the person that I'm mentoring is I can open the door, but you have to get through the door. And I wouldn't recommend you if I didn't think that you had the ability to get through the door. So mentors are not going to invest their time and recommend you if they think that you're sort of flaky, you don't get things done, you don't follow up. But if you show yourself to be a hard worker, 
a committed person, someone who does what they need to do or asks a question if they don't know, then you're golden because someone can open a door and I guarantee you, you're going to get through it and you're going to get the job. And that's going to lead to who knows what else. We have a question um, from someone who chose to be anonymous mm -hmm. and they said, hi, Sherry, what steps do you take, did you take to make your company Happy on Wheels a possibility? And do you have any advice to rising entrepreneurs? Thanks. Well, that is a absolutely great question. And I have to admit that today was a great conversation and I hope it was recorded in this individual and many individuals have access to it because um, I signed up, but I was busy preparing for this. It was an Albany alum, and it was done by the Alumni Association, and it was an individual talking about entrepreneurship. So um, if, I don't know if you're an alum or not, but I plan to actually go back and watch it because even though my husband and I did, did this, um, I sort of, we sort of went in line. You know, we had an idea. Um, we knew what we wanted it to be. Um, it's evolved over time when you start to see what niches are available. But one thing I would do is talk to other entrepreneurs because I think the economy is becoming one. Um, some use the word gig economy. I don't think we're, you know, I think we're past gig economy because it's not just in the, um, in the Silicon Valley world. I think we are in a, um, economy of entrepreneurs, because I think that sort of, I call it the black box companies, um, there's going to be fewer and fewer. We see that happening already. So I see a trend toward entrepreneurship. I would suggest if there are courses at the university or wherever you're, you are, or if there's continuing ed or anything where you can learn about entrepreneurship, um, making your own business plan, figuring out a budget, um, one of the things that I really would advise is defining your niche and figuring out if it's going to work. And it, that it entails a lot of research. And yes, the advantages are you're your own boss and you get to decide yes or no. And you get to decide what day of the week you work and when you work. And those are all pluses. The minuses is you need to make it so that you can financially survive because that paycheck is not going to arrive every two weeks. Uh, you also have to be creative and have the skill set that's needed, or you have to figure out a way to dose it out. So if it's building a website, are you going to do it or you're going to let someone else do it? What, what, where are you going to be on social media? What's your URL going to be? What's your story going to be? How many other people are doing what you do? There's a lot of questions to ask yourself and brainstorm about. Um, and you may have a very good idea, or you may do research and find that somebody else has your same idea, but maybe they're not doing it in such a great way. So we had a vision, my husband and I, for Happy on Wheels, even before I left the government. Um, I love to write. My husband loves to edit. Um, he's amazing at IT. He built the website. I, IT makes me want to lose my mind. So if anything goes wrong, I'm like, Tony. Um, and um, I'm a speaker, as you can tell. And uh, I also really like to mentor. And so um, we wound up doing a lot of things in certain areas. And now we're evolving to another stage as we look at the market. So I know we're getting close to eight. So what I'll close with is say that I think being an entrepreneur and going to do it shows that you're willing to get out of your comfort zone and take a risk, which I talked about in the beginning. You may fall and you may stumble, but don't get discouraged. Keep trying. Um, I know you got to eat, so figure out a way to make sure you save up some bucks or decide that you don't care if you live in your parents' house while you try to get off the ground or whatever it takes. But do your research. And Tony and I, so in the beginning, you know, I did a lot of writing for magazines, which I still do, but those don't pay a lot. I love being a storyteller and that all those things were really, really good to build our base. So we have a really good social media base and you need to capitalize on that. So hopefully my book will capitalize on that base. 
But then I saw, and I'll say this in the last minute, that there's a huge need in the DIE area or DIA or whatever you want to call it. And that's why I decided that our consulting arm would now not just be for resumes and job coaching, but that getting this certification from Cornell could really help in filling that space and offering that service to others. Because as a woman with a disability, I check two boxes, but I don't know what I don't know. And I'm getting a glimpse of what it's like to be an online learner. It's definitely different. So thank you so much for having me. Thanks to all of you for coming. And I hope that you got some nuggets out of this that you can apply to your own life. And uh, have a great evening. Sherry, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody who joined us this evening. And if you didn't see in the chat, there will be a recording of this webinar available next week. And everyone who attended will be receiving the URL when it's available so that you will be able to view the recording. So thank you again. Um, people are writing in the chat room, Sherry, thank you, and that they enjoyed the presentation and that it was a great presentation. Um, lots of great presentations and thank yous in the chat room. So everybody really enjoyed this, Sherry. Thank you so much. Great. And thank you, Carrie. I really appreciate what you and your office are doing. I love the new name. I've got to get used to the new acronym and the new name, but it's very forward thinking. And um, I look forward to future collaboration on hopefully some exciting things for um, Albany. And I'd be remiss if I didn't thank um, Stephanie Snyder and Lloyd Vera Cruz from the alumni office that have just been an absolute pleasure uh, to work with. They've been phenomenal and I, I really have enjoyed getting to know them. So thank you.